All right, I know we're still having a few people enter, but I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Shania Das from New York Legal Assistance Group. I want to welcome everyone here today to the fifth training in the Trauma Responsive Lawyering Training Series brought to you by the Office of Victim Services. Dr. Uju Berry with Columbia University led the creation of this series and brought together a group of mental health practitioners and lawyers, all of whom have specific expertise in working with survivors of trauma to prepare and present these trainings. One of the core individuals involved in this development, Dr. Elizabeth Fiddleson, will be presenting to you today. Today's training is on mental health safety assessments for intimate partner violence advocates. Thank you all for taking this space to devote time to this important topic. We are grateful to continue to have such incredible engagement by so many advocates and legal professionals serving survivors across various fields of practice. I think we have over 100 people already and are still letting them in today. This reflects the strength of our community and our shared commitment to continue to build and hone our skills so that we can better serve survivors. I'm going to turn over to Integra Feliciano, another essential member of the team, for a few administrative details before we get started. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So a couple of logistics. So this webinar will be recorded. The chat feature is moderated by Shani Ades. So if you have any questions, comments, please send them to the chat as directed to the co-host or host. Um, you will automatically be muted upon entering. Please mute yourself throughout the entire seminar unless stated otherwise. If you're joining us today on the phone, please use star six to mute yourself. At the end of the session, you'll be invited to fill out an evaluation. Please complete this as soon as possible. If you wish to obtain CLE credit, there'll be a second evaluation to fill out. Relevant course materials are also in the Google Drive that you guys have all been sent the link to the registration email. Uh, for obtaining CLE credit, please see the registration link for the information. An email with further information will also be sent to you after this training. To get CLE credit, you must attend this entire session and name, um, please put your name onto the Zoom and respond to both polls confirming your attendance during the session. For more information, you can also email Shani at sades at nyleg.org. Our speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Fiddleson. Uh, she is an associate professor of psychiatry and the co-founder and director of the women's program in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center. She completed her medical training and residency at Columbia University New York Presbyterian Hospital, as well as a fellowship in public psychiatry at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Her area of clinical expertise includes the evaluation and treatment of psychiatric disorders across the female life cycle, including perinatal, psychopharmacologic management, ooh, that was a big one, <laughs> menstrual cycle and perimenopause related disorders, infertility and pregnancy loss, as well as trauma and the intersection of IPV and mental health. Dr. Fiddleson co-directs the Columbia Psychiatry Domestic Violence Initiative, a collaboration with the Chapman Perelman Foundation, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, and NYC Health and Hospitals providing psychi psychiatric care to domestic violence survivors at New York City's Family Justice Center. Thank you, Integra, and um, thanks to everyone joining us today and um, for everyone's participation in this seminar. It really continues to blow me away every week um, how much interest interest and engagement you all are ha have with this topic. Um, so the topic today is mental health safety assessments for IPV advocates. Oh, come on. Come on, computer. Okay. So uh, first, um, I don't have any commercial disclosures. I do get some salary support from some um, through Columbia, from some fa family foundations, as well as a small amount from that National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so what I'm hoping today, I'm, I'm really hoping today's talk will be engaging and I really encourage as much participation as we can uh, manage with this. Um, the purposes are really to, number one, recognize when your clients may be at high risk of a mental health crisis or self-harm. 
Number two, learn some of the basic tools for risk assessment and safety planning in your office or workplace or whatever the virtual, this virtual version of that is. Uh, and then finally, I'm hoping we can um, end today's session by addressing some of the um, thorny issues that we all run into um, when the legal system and the mental health system intersects for our vulnerable, vulnerable clients and really thinking through some of the differences in the ethical frameworks and how we can best collaborate um, to help our clients. So um, I wanna pause here and just acknowledge that by the nature of this topic, this is difficult. Um, as a psychiatrist, I talk about suicide and self-harm all the time. And you, as I'm sure you guys know in, um, the legal word world, you sort of get used to talking about it. So I apologize in advance if I um, forget to pause and acknowledge how difficult this topic is, um, but it really is, it can be quite difficult. We will be viewing videos and discussing situations in which individuals who have experienced trauma describe some of their experiences and as well as their intense reactions, including expressing thoughts of suicide and self-harm as well as of other mental health system symptoms. So please, if you need to step away, take, take a breath, um, take care of yourself, um, and uh, please let me know if um, you need me to slow down or to, uh, if I have um, been inadvertently uh, insensitive, it's a hazard <laughs> of being a psychiatrist. So first, why are we talking about mental health risk assessments? We're, you, know, you guys are legal professionals, not psychiatrists. Um, so we're gonna attempt some engagement here um, with a couple of polls. So if these don't work, we can just do it in the chat, but um, I'd, like you to, I'd like to get a sense of what you guys, what your experiences have been so far working with this um, client population um, in terms of self-harm and risk assessment and safety planning. So can we try to launch the polls? Okay, so there's three questions. The first question is, have you had clients you were worried may be at risk of self-harm? Um, a, sort of yes, happens all the time. B, once or twice a year. C, yes, but only rarely, maybe once or twice ever. Um, and uh, D, no, I've never had that concern. Question two is how confident do you feel in your ability to assess, assess self-harm risk? Uh, a is a piece of cake, I'm a pro. Um, B is I'm confident I can do a pretty good job. C is it would be difficult, but I think I can do it. D is I don't feel very comfortable assessing this. And E is, it doesn't matter, we shouldn't be asking about suicide risk anyway. So question three is, how much do you agree with this statement? My organization or workplace has the resources I need to handle client mental health crises when they arise. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. So we'll give it another, um, you know, 20 seconds or so maybe. It uh, looks like there's, a robust response. So I am, I'm actually quite interested to hear what you have to say. All right, our responses are slowing down a little bit. Oh, here we go. Okay. So, um, all right. So uh, looking at the results, it sounds like there's a pretty, uh, big spread. So about 15% say that self-harm risk happens all the time. Um, so most of you have had some experiences with clients at risk of self-harm, which is um, not actually that surprising, I think, with this group, uh, according, you know, based on my experience, certainly. In terms of confidence, it looks like we've got a little bit of a normal curve going on here in terms of uh, confidence. Congratulations to those of you who feel like it's a piece of cake, because um, I wish I felt that confident. Um, and um, finally, uh, you know, there seems to also be a spread of um, 
feeling like you have the mental health supports available for your clients when, when they arise. Um, so thank you for um, participating and um, let's move forward. Okay. All right, so as I think we saw, um, based on the number of people who, who said, the vast majority of you who have said that you have had some clients you've been worried about, suicide is a big deal and it affects a lot of our clients. Um, and very likely, more likely than not, it has affected some of you in your personal lives as well. So I also just want to stop and acknowledge that although we're talking about suicide in terms of um, our work, our mutual work with traumatized clients, um, it's also important to, that we all acknowledge that this is something that happens in our lives. Um, and in particular, this in this stressful year, many people have been struggling more with mental health issues um, and the isolation of the pandemic. So a little epidemiology, suicide is the third leading cause of death among youth age 20, 10 to 24 in the United States. Uh, in terms of death by suicide, about 20% of people who die by suicide are, are women, are identified as women, and about 80% are men. However, women are more likely to attempt suicide and men are more likely to die by suicide. That has a lot to do with the methods used. So men are far more likely to use firearms um, and other um, highly lethal means when they make a suicide attempt. In fact, I don't have the statistic up here, but I was surprised, uh, maybe it shouldn't be, that over 50% of suicides in this country are by firearm. Oops, oops, okay. In New York State, um, New York State actually compared to the rest of the country looks pretty good. We're 49th out of 50th in terms of rates of suicide. So the rate per 100,000 population in New York is 8.28 versus nationally it's 14.21. New York State has invested a number of resources in mental health and suicide prevention and um, hopefully that's what this represents in terms of resources and, and um, safety net. This data, by the way, is from 2018. So it doesn't, it, even though it says 2020, it really doesn't reflect 2020, it goes to 2018. Nevertheless, even in New York State, on average, one person died by suicide every five hours. And more people die by suicide, far more people die by suicide in New York than in alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents. I um, deal with in my, most of the time when I'm doing clinical work, I am um, uh, do uh, maternal mental health. I also um, work with the city and the maternal mental, uh, the maternal morbidity, the mortality committee. And many people are surprised to know that suicide is the, one of the top three causes of maternal mortality. So all cause maternal mortality or pregnancy associated mortality includes death of a woman in pregnancy or within the first year postpartum from any cause. So homicide and suicide are the one number one and two causes of death, of pregnancy associated death in this country and they're higher rates than uh, hemorrhage, preeclampsia, or eclampsia and embolism. Very relevant um, to this group um, in the pregnancy associated suicides when they looked through the uh, charts or the case reviews, in about 50% of the suicide cases, there had been some mention of domestic or other family violence. Um, so this is a particularly high risk group. Um, our, our interest in this particular topic and really understanding of how critical it is to address self-harm risk in our mutual population of um, survivors of intimate partner violence and gender-based violence comes out of the, some of the work we did um, in 2013-2014 when we were initially putting together a pilot project uh, in co collaboration with the Chapman Perlman Foundation, um, OCDV at the time, now NGBV, and in New York City and New York City Health and Hospitals, where we um, 
I sent, we sent uh, Mayumi Akuda Benavides, who was our wonderful intrepid psychiatrist and Rosa Rajinkos, uh, into the Bronx Family Justice Center. Um, and then Dr. Barry uh, fortunately joined us shortly thereafter um, and started seeing clients there um, and started an integrated um, uh, mental health uh, evaluation and treatment center and in integrated into the Bronx Family Justice Center. So that's a, it was a, you know, that program, which now continues and Dr. Barry runs is a wonderful program. I think we should talk about that maybe in our last session, we can talk about some of the models that, um, that can move things forward um, with this population. But what I wanted to highlight is that we did a chart review of our first 106 patients that we evaluated. So the first 106 clients who were referred to us and evaluated, 98% uh, were female, the mean age was 37, English and Spanish were the dominant languages, but there were over a dozen other languages spoken. Diagnostically, the uh, main diagnoses that we saw when we, um, upon the initial evaluation were post-traumatic stress disorder, perhaps not surprisingly, major depressive disorder, other anxiety disorders, and substance use disorders. And there's a high level of comorbidity. That's why it adds up to more than 100%. Most strikingly, and something that really was a surprise to us, um, was that 42 of these initial 106 clients um, had reported a prior suicide attempt before uh, coming to be seen in the Bronx. And 20 of those 42 patients had had no meaningful mental health care prior to the assessment with us in the Bronx. Just for a basis of comparison, in a general psychiatry, hospital-based psychiatry clinic, you would expect about 10% of the patients walking in the door there to have made a prior suicide attempt. So this is four times higher risk than even a dedicated psychiatry clinic. Between that and the, um, the acknowledgement that so few, the relatively few of these very uh, high risk clients um, who had actually made suicide attempts, had engaged in mental health services, really drove home for us both that this uh, work is desperately needed and our client, our mutual clients are at um, high risk of distress and despair um, and suicide, and that all of the barriers we know are there to accessing meaningful mental health care uh, are real barriers that have been um, a big problem and continue to be. So, the question is, one of the questions I have is, well, why, um, why is suicide so, more, so much more common in our highly traumatized populations? Um, if you recall, when Dr. Barry uh, gave her talk in the, um, a few, several weeks ago at this point, she discussed the ACEs study, which probably many of you are familiar with. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and that um, includes um, things like childhood abuse or neglect, the death of a parent, divorce, substance use in the family, um, and other adverse uh, childhood experiences. The original ACEs study was done at Kaiser Permanente in California with a largely white uh, middle class population. And even in that study, what they found was that there was a direct correlation between the number of ACEs of adverse childhood experiences reported and suicide attempts in adulthood. So for example, for people who had zero ACEs, there were far less than one in 100, less than 1% made a suicide attempt, far less than 1%. For people who reported three ACEs, three adverse childhood experiences, 10% of those people, 10 out of 100, had made a suicide attempt. And when you get to seven ACEs, 20% of uh, those individuals had made a suicide attempt. So again, this is quite a different population to the ones that we see that we often see in our um, advocacy settings. And you can see that there's this direct correlation between these early uh, traumatic experiences and our clients who continue to be traumatized and their risk for suicide. This goes along with some of our prior lectures too by uh, Denise Hien and Kate Walsh, who discussed the neurobiology of trauma and what we know about that as well as the effects of revictimization. So if you recall from those lectures, we know that trauma has a profound effect and particularly childhood trauma or what we call developmental trauma, the traumas that sort of accumulate across the, over the developmental life cycle. 
that those have a profound effect on the central nervous system and effect, affect the, um, our systems of arousal and reactivity. By arousal, we uh, mean um, responsiveness. So your reactivity to uh, stresses in the present, for example. So this includes both the hypervigilance and hyper arousal that we often see and associate with sort of classic post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as the hypo arousal or hypo reactivity, the under reactivity to certain types of stresses or to certain types of risky situations. Similarly, um, trauma has an impact on emotion regulation and emotion regulation really is how, how um, how you deal with the intense feelings that get triggered by events in the present, and then how those coping, how you, how those coping mechanisms, a, how effective they are, and b, um, what types of secondary harm those um, or benefit those coping mechanisms have. So all of these interact and increase the risk of self harm in our populations. Um, and there's other data that suggests that. Um, while childhood trauma itself is associated with higher risk, that, the, that people, individuals who continue to experience re-victimization or subsequent trauma are at the highest risk of self-harm. So in most cases, the, that's, in many cases, those are our clients. Um, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna try to play a bit of a video here um, that I thought was really helpful to, uh, this is an individual discussing his own experience of suicide attempt in adulthood, in adolescent and adulthood, and the connection with his early life trauma. Um, just as a content warning, he does describe very broadly his experience of childhood physical and sexual abuse, as well as his, and discusses his suicide attempts. So I'm going to, I, unfortunately I couldn't embed these videos, so forgive me, I'm gonna try to get a little clunky but I'm gonna try to, um, where's my Chrome here? All right, I'm gonna share, oh, that's the wrong video. Okay, that's the wrong video. Pardon me one moment. This is the one I want. Now I will go back and to my Zoom and share. This is the one. My father wasn't really around much when I was a child. But when he was there, uh, it wasn't really much better. He was kind of an intense alcoholic and it made him a pretty angry person. Um, so he would uh, you know, beat my mother, uh, my sister and myself when we were young. So when he left, it was actually, it was much better. <laughs> After he left, unfortunately he left with my mom uh, in the boat of being a single mother and so, she would have to drop me off with a babysitter. And uh, unbeknownst to her, uh, that babysitter was a pedophile. Um, and so over the course of when I was four to basically when I was old enough to take care of myself, uh, I was being taken advantage of uh, by the babysitter. The only really way to survive a situation like that was just to kind of detach my brain from my body and uh, to kind of ignore all the feelings that I was feeling at the time. <laughs> when I turned 16, um, I made an attempt on my own life. I do remember my mother telling me after that, um, to just focus on school, uh, everything would be better with time. And so it's kind of what I did. I just kind of ignored everything, uh, pushed it on the rug, and uh, just, just try to focus on school as much as possible. 
friend of mine told me to uh, take a photography class with them. And so I did. And I, I really started falling in love with the process. And really started falling in love with the things that I was making. So I just kept at it. You know, I kept my brain occupied on this one thing. And before I knew it, I became a lot better at it. And I was doing great. It was really awesome to see the passion and the interest that I found when I was a 16 year old uh, finally started to pay off. I kind of felt like I was going somewhere. And then three years ago, when I was 25 years old, uh, I made another attempt on my life. And it really kind of caught me off guard and it really confused me because, you know, at that time I was a really active commercial photographer in Kansas City, had a great job. I was in a loving relationship at the time. And, uh, you know, I was really, really good at work. And uh, I, you know, I really kind of hated my life and like coming home was the hard part. Going to work was easy. And that's uh, when I realized I started to need to start feeling some feelings, essentially, feeling what was inside. After that second attempt, I started going to therapy, started trying to figure some things out. And then I came to the realization that I didn't really know how to process all of my emotions. I kind of just ignored them uh, up to this point. You know, I couldn't tell if I was hungry. I couldn't tell if I was stressed. I couldn't tell if I was sad. All I knew was what was in front of me and uh, to hammer out all these tasks, you know, because the task at hand was much more alive than, than I was at that point. Okay, I'm going to pause here. Um... And, um, you know, what I wanted everyone to experience with this remarkable person's discussion of his childhood and suicide attempts was um, the connection between what he experienced as a trauma, uh, the experience of trauma as a child, the totally adaptive response to that as a child, which was just shut, shutting down his emotional systems, and then how it came back as an, as an adolescent and as an adult, um, which often does happen at times um, kind of paradoxically where things appear to be safe um, or going well um, and can really blindside people. I'm gonna just show a little bit from the end of this because I want you to just see how, um, I don't wanna leave this person in distress, um, and he has a beautiful story and shares his art. So I'm just going to play one more minute of this, if I can. And it wasn't until I developed a film that I would look at them and realize there was a lot more going on in my head than I thought. I would truly feel like you know I was staring at some memories rather than just you know some pixels on a screen. These photographs kind of serve as a translation. And what it's trying to translate is a process of simply being human in that I saw something and it made me feel strongly enough that I would pick up a camera and push a button and capture what moved me in the first place. It wasn't until weeks later that I realized the significance of that internal movement what made me feel to begin with. And so trying to translate that process of just simply feeling, simply being alive, simply being here, simply participating in this thing that I've recently come to understand as my own life, that I wasn't aware that I was so significant in, I suppose. I never really grew up to understand my emotions, let alone talk about them, and photography gave me an outlet to express these things that I did not know how to express. It allows me to come full circle and to truly face things that, that do scare me or to really take the time to acknowledge the things that do make me happy. So um, I don't think it'll ever stop. Okay. 
So I'm going to stop sharing this video and go back to my presentation. Everyone can take a bit of a breath. Um, I I find that video very moving and um, emotional. So let's all take a breath while I finish uh, figuring out how to share my slides again. Okay. 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 Okay, so um, yes, I know it's very abrupt going from a, a video to talking at, about at, at some slides again, um, but I do want to give some definitions and a little bit of discussion so that we um, and description of how um, those of us in mental health um, think about um, suicide and thoughts of suicide and some of the activities that we associate with suicide. Um, so that we have a shared language for how to manage it. So the first thing I just want to mention is that there is a difference between suicide attempts or suicidal behavior and what we call non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI, or non-suicidal self-harm. These are deliberate actions that cause injury, but that are not intended to result in death. Um, these are common coping responses that many people with trauma have developed over time because they have worked for them. And um, they are not, most often, they are not a sign of acute risk of suicide. People who do engage in non-suicidal self-injury overall may be at higher risk than other people um, to make a suicide, a, a suicide attempt at some point in their life, but these um, self-injurious behaviors themselves are not necessarily signs of being acutely suicidal. And so it's important if you have a client who describes some of those behaviors um, but denies being suicidal, or who you may see some scars or some evidence that they have engaged in some self-injury, this is not necessarily a sign uh, that they're at imminent risk, um, it's a sign that they have been in distress um, and they may or may not want to discuss it. So the term suicidal ideation is sort of a general term that gets thrown around um, for any thoughts about death or suicide. When we say um, passive suicidal ideation or passive SI in a, in a chart note, um, that's sort of a, a shortcut for what we think of what we consider um, the types of suicidal thoughts that are about dying or wishing for death or wishing to go to sleep and never wake up, but without any specific plan or intent. And this type of suicidal thought is much, much more common than having specific plan or intent or being at risk. So many of the people who experience what we call passive suicidal ideation are not necessarily at super high risk for acting on them. Although, of course, um, any thoughts about death or suicide do, are, uh, are concerning enough and should be taken seriously. When we say active suicidal ideation or active SI in a chart, again, it's pretty, it's, it's a sort of lazy short, shortcut, but um, what we mean is real is thoughts about killing oneself with some specific plans or intent to act or and or engaging in preparatory acts um, with a plan to uh, uh, engage in suicidal behavior. Some of the risk factors for people um, that have been identified that uh, for, for individuals at risk of making a suicide attempt I'm going to talk about the individual um, relational and community risk factors. Some of the individual risk factors include prior attempts. That's probably one of the highest um, prior attempts in a history of mental illness and particularly depression are the two strongest individual risk factors. A history of substance use, particularly recent use, social isolation, impulsivity or a history of impulsive behaviors, job or financial problems, criminal or legal problems, violence either as a victim or perpetrator in the last year, 
and physical illness, including um, a chronic conditions, HIV, and those with poor prognosis or impairment. So, um, and then I'll go through some of these. Some of the relational suicide risk factors include adverse childhood ex experiences, as we discussed, bullying, a family history of suicide, um, relationship problems, um, including breakups, as well as violence and loss, and uh, sexual violence. The community and societal risk factors uh, include barriers to health and mental health care, a suicide cluster in a given community, um, stigma associated with mental illness or help seeking, easy access to lethal means such as firearms or medications, unsafe media portrayals of suicide, as well as racial, economic, and gender inequities. Some of the things that are, are sort of the highest risk, uh, risk factors include the access to firearms, high, expressing high levels of hopelessness, insomnia, sleeplessness, anxiety, or acute panic attacks, or agitation, sort of that feeling you can't sit still. Um, people who have psychotic symptoms, including command auditory hallucinations, which means hearing voices telling them to hurt themselves. Substance use, um, loss of any of the protective factors, such can, as can happen in losing custody or the death of a loved one or a loss of housing or faith, or a new or relapse in a substance use disorder. So um, before I get to protective factors, one of the things that we sort of came to realize when we started the uh, pilot program in the Bronx was that um, in fact, many of those, you guys probably were check, ticking off the list of uh, risk factors and like, you know, probably 90% of your clients have one or more of these risk factors or they wouldn't be seeing you. Um, and so we really had to think about how do we, how do we think about as mental health professionals, think about risk in the context of working with a population who already at baseline has um, so many of what are sort of objectively the risk factors we think about. Um, and just as a, as a side note too, I think um, one of the things, the other thing that we, we recognized when we first started this work was that actually as mental health professionals, while this is a, is a challenging population, you know, we're very used to talking about self-harm and suicide and asking that and kind of having some ideas about what to do about it. But the experience of having a, a client report that they're at risk of being harmed by um, their partner or by a former partner and um, that there really wasn't much to do about it. I, I can't even describe how intolerable, I know it feels intolerable to everyone, but we just were not used to that at all. And so actually when we, when we first started in the Bronx, there was this very nice like coming together of, um, we would run to the case managers and, and say, help, how do I do, how do I tolerate this? How do I, you know, do a safety plan? Um, and they would come to us with the, the clients who were expressing some um, concerning suicidal thoughts. And it was a very nice collaboration. And I think an example of how we all need to work together um, for our clients and bring our particular focus and expertise. Some of the protective factors include um, sort of a cultural norms that um, can be protective against suicide. Um, coping and problem solving skills, which I you know, wanna highlight as a modifiable risk factor that in fact learning different coping skills and engaging in active problem solving around emotional, emotion regulation is protective. Religious beliefs can be protective, feeling connected to and needed by others, including for children or loved ones having hope for the future or uh, positive survival beliefs about yourself, as well as access to care and supportive relationships with providers. All that said, there is not one single risk or protective factor that can fully predict or explain suicide risk. We're actually not very good at predicting who is going to move from sort of a high risk category to making a suicide attempt. Um, so although we're talking about, we're gonna talk about how to do a risk assessment and what to do about it, I really want you to understand that, you know, in, those mo in the moments that people end up um, engaging in suicidal behavior, 
they're really the only ones who have any control. And if you are working with a client, and even, and even if you've known about this, if you feel like you've asked the right questions or not, it is not your fault if your client makes a suicide attempt or dies by suicide <clears throat> or engages in self-harm. It's a really hard thing to um, cope with, but it really isn't your fault. And I put this quote from a suicide survivor who said that after a certain point, you feel like you're burning alive and all you can think of is how to put the fire out as quickly as possible. And really those moments, that sort of moment of impulsivity is, is, is a moment of isolation and no one, and most often no one is there. So we really try to work together <clears throat> to help people not get to that point where they're feeling that way. Um, but I just want you to understand um, that although we're talking about this, this doesn't mean you're responsible. So this is how um, SAMHSA um, uh, and Health and Human Services uh, communicate about a clinical risk evaluation for how mental health providers think about risk. Um, so there's, this is a safety uh, card. This is sort of how we, we frame it. And we think about identifying what are the risk factors, um, including those that can be modified, identifying protective factors and resiliency factors and supports, doing a suicide assessment, which we will talk about how to do, determining the risk level, high, moderate, or low, um, and choosing a course of action in response to that, and then documentation. So, and then, you know, thinking about um, what these high, moderate, low levels mean, um, the levels of, of suicidality that we're concerned about, and some of the responses. Now, you guys are not um, mental health professionals, but I wanted you to sort of get the big picture about it the way we often think about suicide when we're self-harm risk, when we're doing an evaluation and trying to put all these pieces together to come up with a comprehensive plan and work together with our patients to keep them safe. Okay, so I'm going to um, start a video and uh, my dear colleague Rosa, who is here with us today, uh, kindly volunteered to play the client, um, but I, I guarantee you she's just fine. She's just a very good actress. Um, and this is sort of based off of um, a couple of clients we, we've seen together. Um, so I'm going to play clips of the video and then we'll pause and have, some, have a chance to um, have a little bit of uh, interaction and discussion. So Rosa is playing a 37-year-old client at a domestic violence advocacy center. She had a history of childhood abuse and was tra trafficked by her first husband to this country at the age of 17. She later fled that relationship in fear for her life, but left behind, behind her young child. She is now in another relationship with two children, but reached out hoping to regain parental rights for her now 12-year-old son in another state. You've just had to deliver bad news about her case. So um, once again, as I'm uh, transitioning to the video here, I do want to um, acknowledge that, first of all, this is a situation that you may be familiar with. Um, Rosa does a really good job of portraying a high level of distress, which may also be um, difficult to handle. So please feel free to step away. And then also um, just ignore what I say about anything legal because uh, I just was kind of winging it. So I'm a little bit embarrassed about the things that I say. <laughs> And no, in no way do I think that I'm perfect here in terms of engaging with her or any of the things that uh, um, we're talking about. So I'm not holding this up as the perfect model for any, uh, by any means, but just an example of how on the spot you might engage. So let me stop sharing here. And then I will switch to my video. All right. Oh, it's torture seeing yourself on these videos. Okay, I'm going to play this clip, uh, this first part, and then we'll pause and have some discussion and we'll go back and forth. So, Rosa, what I'm saying today is after exploring the state laws in Louisiana, as well as thinking about your immigration status and the current situation at home for you. I've talked to my colleagues and unfortunately there aren't any more legal avenues we have 
that can help you regain some custody of your son. So we've kind of hit the end of the road from a legal perspective. Um, hopefully there are other avenues where you, that you might explore. Um, and I, I for sure want to connect you with some of the other, my other colleagues who can be helpful with that. But at this time, there's nothing more I can do than help. Um, this is this is hard. I wish I had better news for you today. You know, I, I do want to continue this conversation because even though there may not be legal avenues at this time, there still may be other ways to get what you are really looking for. No. No. Rosa, I can see how upset you are. Is there is there anyone at home with you right now? <laughs> yeah, I know you've had hope based on the on the legal things we've been talking about, but I don't think this is the end of the road. Not okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Um, and again, I wanna give credit to Rosa in terms of her um, acting ability and reassure everyone once again that she's okay, but acknowledge also that these are situations that you may um, may find yourself in that are quite difficult. So I want to pause. I wanted to pause here because I thought it was a good opportunity to um, review some of the grounding techniques that we discussed last week that Dr. Herbert, Dr. Farah Herbert, um, was kind enough to share with us. And I, this is actually um, a picture of the grounding kit that I keep, I have little baggies of grounding kits. We actually made our program kind of put a bunch together, about a hundred together that we distributed to clients over the holidays one year. Um, and so this is the grounding kit. So let me ask you, and you can uh, please, if you feel comfortable, put it in the chat. Um, what might you do or say now? You're giving bad news over Zoom to a client who is um, demonstrating a high level of distress and some dysregulation. What might you say or do now? I'm gonna give everybody a moment to enter things into the chat. We have a few things coming in already. Um, so one thing somebody's saying is, is not cut off the call really quickly. This isn't the moment to hang up, um, to continue to engage and not just leave them alone. Um, somebody mentioned saying to them, remember you are not alone. Um, perhaps drop, trying to draw on with the client and identify with them, who do they have? That, that was obviously started in the video and to continue down that path. Um, you know, Try to make a very specific plan for follow-up. I know sometimes I've been I've been told in the in the past like talk about future plans that they might have, even as basic of what are you going to be doing later today. Let's talk about some things you can do this weekend. Um, somebody mentioned that if they're unable to kind of break the repetitive pattern of the response, which was happening in the video, to try to to sidestep that a little bit, ask other questions about other things that might be going on with family members you've heard of before, other things in their life and circle back around. Um, and a lot of people that are saying, you know, check in. Great question, Dr. Herbert mentioned this to us. Ask how they're feeling, get really specific with how it is they're doing. Um, do some perhaps breathing exercises, focus on things that are in the room if you can't break out of this cycle. So great to have all these people remembering stuff. 
Um, and then other people are talking on here that are talking about um, if you can focus on one achievable thing, no matter how small it is, there's nothing small when somebody's going through a mental health crisis or a mental health, health exacerbated state. Um, and so um, even one small achievable thing, as well as hopefully connecting them with resources. One thing I'm gonna add is also perhaps connecting yourself with resources. Right. Um, right. Yeah, so all these are amazing. You guys are, uh, <laughs> You guys are amazing, and you clearly are pros who have been who have been in this situation before, um, and your clients are all really lucky to have you. So I'm gonna, um, at the risk of more personal embarrassment, I'm gonna show you what I did. Although I think we have to break for the uh, yes. poll, right? Thank you. I'm gonna quickly put up a CLE poll. A little bit difficult to navigate that in the midst of this conversation. I apologize for interrupting. For folks who don't see the poll on their screen, just a reminder, it might be hidden behind a different window that you should look to. I'm going to um, turn this back over so you can continue with the talk and move forward. I'll leave the poll up for a full minute before I close it. Anybody who's having issues responding to the poll, please just privately message me in the chat. Thanks. All right, thanks all. Okay, so let me skip forward a little bit. Um, and I can, we can all hear what a, um, my attempt to, uh, to do some grounding there. Uh, hold on, where is she? So can we pause for a moment? I just, I, I can see how upset you are about this and I wanna, I wanna be able to, connect you to the people who I think can help you move forward. Do you have a, do you have a glass of water or something? Okay, perfect. Let's just drink some water and let's just take a couple of deep breaths for a moment. See that you're breathing really heavily. It's okay, let's, let's just breathe for a moment and remember that you're, you're not Back in the situation, you're okay and you're safe. You're here right now. And let's just take a couple of deep breaths. Okay, so take a breath in through your nose. Okay, okay. just breathe. Just try to relax your mind for a moment. Okay, I think you all did a much better job answering the question than I did on the spot there, Rosa. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna then skip ahead a little bit um, to the next section here. Um, and so we spend a few, a little few minutes um, settling things down and then um, Rosa goes on to, to, to discuss her feelings of hopelessness. Yeah, you have been doing this a long time, and it's and it's it is hard. What I'm gonna do? For what? Rosa, I, I hear that you're so upset. I'm a little confused. Okay. So once again, I'm gonna pause here and um, again, let's all take a, take a couple of deep breaths. I think that, um, you know, sometimes these situations as I'm watching it now, I can really feel how, um, 
this hits close to home. Uh, are those? Oh wait, hold on. Okay, so she expresses some, Rosa expresses here some, some hopelessness. So how might you respond when, if you've had the situation, or let's think about, um, you know, you've kind of settled someone down and now she's shifted from sort of dysregulation and being upset to expressing some things that make you concerned that she may actually have some thoughts about self-harm or maybe at some risk. So um, if you've had experience with this or how might you think about responding? Is it any different from what you said before? And we'll pause here for just a moment. Yeah, so um, our first response is ask her directly. Um, with that first response, we also have a question that I, that I think is very linked to this, if you don't mind me posing mm -hmm. it now, that we could save it for later if you'd like, um, mm -hmm. which is what happens if, for example, right now, you do have this inclination, you wanna ask directly, but they hang up on you. What is it that you would do next? Ooh, really, really uh, important question, right? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this may have happened. So, um, I don't pretend to know totally. I think that one of the things, one of the basic things I, I've certainly had to learn um, in this time is to be as careful as possible to, to try to know um, where your clients are when you're speaking to them over Zoom, particularly if you know that they're someone who is high risk or if you have to deliver some difficult news. Um, and just to see if there's anyone with them, if they're at a place where they could get resources, or if, you know, if for example, they're, they're in a shelter, do you know what shelter it is? Is there a um, case manager who um, can check in on the client if they don't get back to you? Um, and I certainly don't think there's one right answer for certain. I would try to re-engage the client right away, right? That you're not just gonna let her hang up on you and say like, okay, well, there's nothing more I can do. And obviously all of you are here because you wouldn't do that. Um, but she may or may not pick up. She may or may not respond. And that's a lot of, um, it's very hard to tolerate when you have, you don't have enough information that makes you say, okay, I have to do something, but just enough to really make you worry. Um, and I think that that space is, I know, I know that that space is really hard to hold. So I think we do the best we can to re-engage the client. Um, you might leave a message, send a text if that's available. Um, if, you, uh, if you're very concerned and you know where they are or there's a, someone that they trust or have said that they confide in that you have access to the number, if you're very concerned, you might access one of those individuals. Um, but um, oftentimes, um, unless you're acutely concerned about their safety, about imminent risk, giving people a chance to take a, like re-engage right away, but then if they don't pick up or don't respond, give them a few hours to, um, and you're not super concerned, give them a few hours to take a breath themselves and, and try to re-engage. You know, one of, the, one of the basic principles and protective factors we talked about is not feeling alone. And, um, you know, your clients have a relationship with you and even when you've just had to deliver bad news, you can still be a helpful person in their life and even just demonstrating that you're not giving up on them, even if they feel hopeless, can really help. And so they may not um, pick up your call, but they may see that you're calling and trying to re-engage and doing that a few times. You don't want to harass someone, but, but demonstrating that you're not abandoning them just because you have said, there's nothing more I can do. You're not washing your hands of them. Um, Non-abandonment is actually a very powerful thing. So like I said, I didn't have the great an greatest answer, but that's the best I think we can do. 
Um, any other comments here? Yes, so some other people are saying, um, and I think this is getting to something you talk a lot about, which is that there's some tension that inherently develops, right, um, in the moment, and, and you're sort of having to respond to what the client needs and just showing up is something. Um, but to attempt to take a st step back, somebody here says, reframe with a strengths-based analysis. Talk about the things that, that they've done. Um, sometimes I even, you know, at some point throw in a like, and I'm sorry that you've had to be that strong in, in the course of talking about it, yeah, like but talk yeah. about the strengths that they have done um, and that they've displayed in the past um, and the good things that have happened or, or differences, even if it's a small win. Um, but also that tension of also like listening to your to your client is that landing for them in that moment in that moment do they just need to be upset and have th those feelings perhaps safely and then setting up a time to follow up with them and kind of validating that like i understand why you are so so upset in this moment i do think there's more to talk about i do think there's more to be done but i think at this moment if what you need is to kind of sit with this you know, linking them with other supports and circling back to that strengths-based analysis perhaps later on. That's great. That's great. So I love that, that sort of acknowledgement and validation of the, um, how painful this is um, and how unfair, um, you know, as well as their personal strengths. So speaking to their personal resiliency and the, what they have gone through before and your sense of them as a strong person, even at this moment where they may feel the most vulnerable, um, that is sort of holding both things at once, right? We talk about a dialectic often in, um, in, um, in therapy where you have to, it's not either or, it's not a binary. You can both be highly distressed and vulnerable and incredibly strong and resilient. And so I love these responses because they're getting at both which is really where you need to be, that sweet spot of where you need to be, which is hard to find. And, and sometimes we don't succeed in finding that, although we do our best. But I, I love these responses. Some of the myths, and I think that you guys um, are pretty sophisticated, it sounds like, but um, you know, a lot of the things, the myths about asking about suicide or doing a suicide assessment, which is where we'll move to next, um, are things like ideas that people have sort of even not really well thought out ideas that asking about suicide increases risk. Um, and actually, <laughs> I had a, a, um, a supervisor when I was a trainee who said that, and this is, <laughs> this is, this is not the way to handle when something bad goes on, goes on who actually said that when he, when one of the trainees experienced a, a patient who um, died by suicide, that he didn't like to talk about it because it seemed like that that would sort of open the door to other other things, you know. So even um, mental health professionals get sort of superstitious ideas about suicide and about how, because it's taboo and people worry about talking about it. Um, and there are ways that the media can be very problematic in portraying suicide and romanticizing it. And we won't even talk about 13 reasons why, um, but, um, or even some of the ways that has been portrayed in, the, in, this, in this pandemic when there have been high profile suicides. Um, but asking an individual that you're concerned about, about suicide will not put the idea in your head, I guarantee it, or give them permission. Asking in a concerned and um, uh, thoughtful way is validating and helpful. Um, a lot of other uh, concerns are around what our mental health care system is like and what it's like. If, what, if, what if someone tells me that they're at imminent risk and then I have to, you know, I have to respond to that. What if they get taken in? What if that impacts their legal case or their custody case? Um, the feeling of hopelessness, there's nothing I could do. Or what if, what if the client says that they're acutely suicidal and I have to, you know, I, I feel like I have to act and then they blame me and I, we've lost that, um, that trust and then I can't help them anymore. So some of you have um, gotten to this already in terms of how to talk to clients about risk. So using specific language. So um, I loved hearing that. Someone said that in the, in the comments. So I'm, for example, I'm concerned that you're so understandably upset. Do you feel safe today? Asking about supports, asking about that strength 
practice-based focus about protective factors, both internal individual factors, relational and other supports. Asking if you can about perceptions or past experiences with treatment, and then engaging around connecting to mental health resources. Um, so in terms of asking specifically about suicide and really trying, if you're in this situation, of having some concerns about someone and, and you know, let's say this interview was happening uh, after hours and you don't have your nice colleague down the hall, how do you go to, how do you sleep at night? How do you decide whether this person is someone we really need to um, get connected right now or if this can wait till tomorrow or a few days? Um, and this is where some of the specific uh, suicide risk assessments can be very helpful. Um, the Columbia Suicide, um, oh my gosh, CSSRS, it's the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, that's what it stands for, is a very, is a well-validated tool. There are others, but this is the one that um, we're most familiar with, um, that has a, a broad applicability. It's translated into many languages. Um, and it can help dive down into really understanding what level of risk there is. If you asked all of your clients at the various um, places where we work or at the family justice centers, for example, a lot of them would have what we call suicidal ideation broadly, right? The sort of passive thoughts about wishing or wish to be dead. There is a, you know, anyone who has been, who has felt desperate and trapped, it is highly likely that that is a thought that they have had. Um, so um, it's important to know that going in and not be afraid of asking that question. So the sort of step one is asking that question. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? These are very common um, ideas. And then if that, if they say yes, then you ask more specifically, have you actually had any thoughts about killing yourself? And even that is not necessarily a sign that they're at acute risk or a very imminent risk you then sort of can ask, have you been thinking about how you might do this? So this is getting at, do they have some sort of a plan? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? So many people will get to that point and say, well, I thought about various things, but I would never go through with it. Um, the people who say yes um, are communicating something very important to you at that moment. Um, and that's where we really start to get into the very high risk um, um, evaluations. People are not, um, people are pretty sophisticated. They understand that if they tell you that they are really thinking about harming themselves in the near future, it does, it, they're both informing you of that and in some ways communicating a level of distress that you need to respond to as a human being. So, um, that act of asking and the communication back about that high level of risk is already, you are already engaged with the, with the person you're speaking to. Um, and there, it demonstrates some ambivalence or some willingness to engage around how to stay safe. They wouldn't be telling you that if there was 100% no ambivalence there and no room to work. Um, the fifth question is, have you started to work out or work out the details of how to kill yourself? Do you intend to carry out this plan? Um, and then the sixth question of the screen is, have you ever done anything or started to do anything or prepared to do anything to end your life? Um, and these are the risk, the low, moderate, or high risk. And this is the website you can learn more about this scale. But these are some very um, clear stepwise questions. Once you get a no answer, you don't have to ask all of the questions. Um, so it's, sort of, it's a sequential assessment. So I'm going to go um, show you my um, not so graceful assessment here. Uh, okay. Um, six fifty. Here we go. I'm a little concerned um, about about I'm a bit concerned about you and how you're feeling. I want to ask you a couple of questions just to make sure that that you're safe right now. Do you, do you ever have thoughts that 
you would rather be dead or that you wish you could just go to sleep and not wake up? Mm -hmm. Do you ever actually have any thoughts about killing yourself? Maybe sometimes? Do you ever think about ways that you would actually act on those thoughts on killing yourself? Is that something that you think that you would do, that you have some intention of doing? No, my children were happened to them. You know, what would happen to my children if I'm not there? I just had nobody. Yeah. No, 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 no. So you would, you wouldn't actually do that. It's, it's understandable that you think about that sometimes. That it sounds like your children keep you going. What else what else keeps you going through hard times? Your mother? Okay, I'm going to pause there again. Um, and then uh, I think this is the last time I'll go back and forth here. Okay, so given what we've just talked about, about risk factors and protective factors, um, and looking at sort of the suicide assessment scale, how would you evaluate Rosa's risk and protective factors at this moment? How concerned are you? And then what would you do now? Any thoughts? So it seems like people are saying that, that there's a moderate risk Mm -hmm. perhaps like a, a high moderate in that, you know, it d did seem like she, she, she had an idea, but it didn't seem like it was a formalized or finalized idea. Mm -hmm. And then she herself kind of was able to even self-identify supportive structures that, that she had in place. Um, people say that they would want to keep talking to her. Um, somebody mentioned a little bit ago that, you know, something that, um, you know, they might do is talk about like, what are you going to do when we get off the phone in a minute before they do actually hang, hang up the phone to kind of create, um, a, you know, you're about to get here plan of what could happen next. Um, and somebody else says like, you know, loop the words that she's using, right? Like, um, she's, you know, saying, obviously, I believe that the case was about a custody dispute. So perhaps, but she did identify her mom as a source of strength and perhaps talk about like, where is your mom right now? Could you reach out to your mom today? Um, and just reaffirming um, how important it is that she has those ties and those support um, and that she continues to have support, including from, from us or from you, the person talking to her. 
That's so great. And I wish that I had thought about this, some of those as I was ad-libbing in the moment. <laughs> so yeah, everyone, you know, these are such thoughtful, engaged responses. Um, that's really terrific. So um, I want to, you know, getting to the next thoughts about that, and that's exactly right. Staying, remaining engaged, um, coming up with some concrete things that she can do to connect to those people she has identified as supports. She said earlier that her children were in the other room. Can she spend time with them? Is that helpful? Can she reach out to her mother? Is there anyone else? So I love these like very concrete ideas for the moment. Um, and so this gets to the idea around safety planning. And once again, I wouldn't, you know, as, as a mental health professional, I think about safety planning in a particular context um, and have different components of it. And so I want to describe those to you so you have sort of a broad idea. Um, I think all of you have identified um, just right off the bat, many of the components that we think about when we think about formal safety planning. So I just wanted to give you the framework that we think about individual safety planning, um, because that can, can be helpful if you're in that situation and you're trying to come up with ways to uh, engage a client and feel like you can go home and go to sleep um, as you're waiting to um, engage them in appropriate care. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about sort of more institutional safety plans. And I'm hoping that you guys can share with each other what your each organization or workplace has in place um, to help clients. So when we think about, when we think about safety planning, um, there's different components to this. So we actually engage, this is something that as mental health professionals, when someone identifies suicidal thoughts or we think that they're at high risk or some, you know, uh, moderate to high risk, we think about safety planning and we work with the client um, or patient themselves. So it's, this is directly with the patient. Like, what are the thoughts and feelings when you're suicidal? It's different for everyone. Not everyone has the same feelings that trigger thoughts of death or suicide. Um, for some, it may be um, more anxiety, others it's more depression or just other types of feelings. So don't assume you understand and ask them specifically how they label their own thoughts or feelings. Um, number two is who, who can you call? So writing down the names, like writing down the names and phone numbers of people that in their lives that they can trust and reach out to um, and specify how they can get in contact with them. And if no, if no one answers there, what's the next step? Then engaging some of their positive coping skills or some of the things that do work for them when they're dysregulated and remind them that they have these skills um, that, they, that they have been surviving with. So think of, thinking of instances they felt suicidal or felt very distressed and what they did and what's helpful and write those down too. Um, there are things, um, what are the things that you can change in the environment? And this is, you know, when the, when the safety plan is not, when you're at high, high risk necessarily, but you can, you know, some people actually feel safer if they don't have a, all the medications they've ever taken in their life, in their apartment. Um, and it's a good opportunity to get rid of some of those, for example. Um, and certainly asking about firearm access is very important. Um, identifying the professional resources they have if they are engaged in treatment or what treatment resources might be available. And then finally, some of the crisis resources, um, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, uh, Crisis Text Line, and YC Well for many of our clients and writing those numbers down. And this is a document that in times of need, clients can have with them. So again, I don't expect you guys to be doing formal safety plans like this, but I want you to, I wanted to um, go through it with you to sort of, so that if you're in that situation and ad libbing, you can think have the different categories that you can think of kind of laid out explicitly. Um, and then what resources do your organizations have to support clients who are at risk of self-harm? Are there on-site resources? Are there case managers you can reach out to who are able to engage immediately or within the next day or two? Do you have a relationship with other health or mental health providers or other centers where you can easily or relatively easily, easily access? Do you know what the walk-in centers are or what the crisis resources are? And then finally, what happens in your workplace if someone is at imminent risk of harm to themselves if they're ex actively expressing suicidal thoughts or feelings and intentions on acting on them 
or are acting in ways that you think are um, concerning for their safety or those around them. So um, I can, I might, we might skip this last part of it. Well, well, we'll see, we can take a vote if we wanna see the last part of the video. But I'm curious, um, I'm curious to hear and, and hope that you guys can share a little bit about what you what you have set up, like what resources, those of you who have resources there, um, what types of things have been helpful? And then those of you who don't, like what do you think you need to feel like you're supported? So one thing I wanted to mention while I see some people typing as they come through is, um, I know you referenced this earlier on, but, but the family justice centers um, are, are amazing um, in, in, the, in that um, well, many of the presenters that are coming to you here in this series actually have worked out of them and have colleagues that continue to work out of them. So um, obviously there's, there's a strength of expertise coming from them. Um, but the family justice centers um, are a place where there's kind of a formalized collaboration, for lack of a better way of saying it, between various different service providers, including mental health providers, legal advocates, case managers, um, um, and others who are all kind of there able to provide different types of support for the client um, as, as they're working with them. And whether or not you have those formal links, um, thinking about what perhaps other links are nearby. Um, having organizations reach out to one another to say like, hey, I see that you're in the community that we're in as we're doing this work or that we're serving as we're doing this work. Let's have a call. How do you get clients? How do we get clients? Like are, how could we perhaps you know, work together and, and refer organizations? Um, some people are mentioning that there are legal service organizations. Some do have social workers on staff, mm -hmm. um, which is incredibly helpful. Um, People are saying that they have, you know, lists of resources that they can give out to clients, um, but that they do wish that they had kind of a bigger connection, right? Like not just sending somebody off into the ether, um, which we know it's, it's such a challenge for a survivor to actually like get somebody on the phone. Um, we know that ourselves. Um, so having those direct um, kind of referrals and relationships in place so you could pick up the phone, get advice for yourself perhaps as you're advising the client, as well as find out, do they have capacity? Do they know somewhere else there has capacity and have kind of those soft handoffs? Um, and, and also in, in cases of emergencies that while you're on the Zoom or on the phone that you had somebody in mind that you know you could likely call. Um, and, uh, people that, are, that do have the um, fortune of sitting in places where there are social workers and therapists on hand are all um, continually affirming how, <laughs> how in incredible that has been for themselves and their clients. Yeah, yeah, thank you for everyone for sharing uh, these resources. And I think that if, um, I don't know if people feel comfortable sharing specific resources in the greater New York area in the chat, but we could, or emailing them um, to me or to Shani, but if you have great resources that are what more widely available that you would like to share, we could try to uh, collate some of these as well as some of the ones that we, we know as well and share among this group too. Um, it's, yeah, incredibly helpful. And um, thank you, Shani, for bringing up once again, the um, Family Justice Center and uh, New York City Health and Hospitals collaboration that um, Dr. Barry leads because um, it's a continuation of the project that I was I talked about um, before, and it really um, it really can be a powerful uh, collaboration. And when it works, it works so well. So I really want to you know advocate for for more of that, <laughs> and I think we should all be because I think we also have to acknowledge. Uh, that unfortunately there aren't enough resources for our clients and that um, many of the resources that are there are not um, particularly trauma responsive or trauma informed. And one of the things that I think people worry about and uh, with some reason is, is, you know, is the experience of being sent to or engaging with mental health going to be triggering or re-traumatizing for my client? I wish that, that it weren't a valid concern in some cases, but um, it is. I think things are moving in the right direction, um, but we all need to keep pushing it in the right direction. 
Um, so it's 125. What do you think? Do you want to see the end of the video where I do my best to engage Rosa or should we move on? Maybe we can do the last, we'll do the last few minutes um, so that you can feel good that Rosa's in good hands. Hold on. Okay, so, all right. Okay. You know, I work with some wonderful people who um, do some counseling with many women who have been in very similar situations to yours. Have you ever talked to a counselor or maybe someone at your church? And I don't know because it, it, they say that it, it, it the way you just like, you know, upset and you are like, you know, but that, I called I'm a friend of mine, just the, the CV game. Yeah, I, I understand that's such a, um, makes a lot of people very afraid to say anything. I, I, I do hear that. But I also know that there are some really wonderful counselors and um, I happen to work with, you know, a couple of people who I really trust and I think are wonderful and who also would keep things very confidential. So, you know, my colleague, um, Dr. Farah, is such a lovely, wonderful person and I think that she might be able to help you cope with some of these feelings. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. I don't want education. I can find the No, no, there's no you it's entirely in your control what you what you decide to do or how much you decide to tell someone. I, I would like to introduce you to my colleague. Maybe, maybe we can have another call tomorrow and I can invite Dr. Farah on for just even five minutes just so you can meet her and see what you think. I, I, so I think the most important thing is for you to feel like you're able to keep going. And I think anything that helps you feel like you can have the support you need to keep going is going to help you in your goal to connect with your son. What's that? It is. Do you want me to tell her your situation? Would it be helpful if I told her a little bit about what you're going through? Okay. So I can tell her what your situation is and that you've been feeling really distressed. And then you can see if you feel comfortable setting up a time to meet with her and and see if you feel like you can open up about some of the feelings we've been talking about. I'm going to reach out to some of my colleagues and some of the other agencies and even if there isn't another legal thing we can do, perhaps there are other ways to get in contact with you know that other people will have ideas, but we need you to you. We need you to be in the place where you can do what you need to do and take care of your kids that are with you and keep keep the hope going, which is hard sometimes. Okay. 
Okay, it's it's entirely up to you who you tell what to. That's just like this is this is confidential. What you say is confidential. You know. Oh no, no, I I understand. I'm glad you were able to talk to me about it. I want to make sure that you are going to be safe tonight before we talk tomorrow. Do you think you can be safe? Okay, I, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna send you now um, over email or uh, on your. I'm gonna text you on your phone a couple of resources that I that can be helpful. So one is a hotline you can call anytime, night or day, and it's totally anonymous. And if you're having any more of those thoughts about hurting yourself or any scary thoughts or just even need to reach out, you can call that number. And if you don't have the privacy or you don't feel comfortable talking, there's another um, resource I'm gonna text to you that's like a, that's called a crisis text line. You can just text how you're feeling and interact with someone anytime, day or night. Yeah, it's hard. Okay. So we'll we'll talk again tomorrow at 10, 10 o'clock work, and I'll ask my colleague Dr. Dr. Farah to come on board too. Okay. Okay, so can we all give Rosa a round of applause, please, because she's amazing. It was another untapped skill of her many, many skills. <laughs> um, let me go back to my slideshow here. Okay, so that's all the back and forth. Um, and also just uh, pausing once again, and uh, we'll, we'll shift gears again, but also Acknowledging once again, this is a situation that you've probably encountered uh, professionally or personally, and it can be very difficult. It's very emotional, um, even talking about it. Um, so, some of the things that have come up in the past, talking with some of my legal colleagues about what we're worried about, we're obviously worried about our clients harming themselves. We're worried about them ending up back in abusive situations if because they have mental health issues that are unresolved or they're afraid of uh, getting the help they need or they don't feel able to get out of them because of their mental health issues. Um, we're worried that our clients with mental health issues are more vulnerable to being harmed by their abusers, that they may be deported if they access, that they may be afraid that they may be deported if they access resources. There's the back of our mind front page of the Daily News fear that um, one of the clients that we're working with, well, what if um, something happened and it was out there? It's not something we want to keep in mind, but it's there. Um, as we talked about, clients being re-traumatized at the mental health care system, that they may relapse to substance use or even overdose, that they'll disengage with services, that they'll engage in other self-harm or sort of what we in medicine call loss to follow up, just kind of never reach back out that they may lose custody, they may become homeless, um, or in some cases that they may be a risk, that our clients may be a risk to the children. These are a lot of worries and burdens that all of you carry for many of the clients that you work with who are in high levels, who come to you in crisis or in high levels of distress, and you have to help them navigate a very difficult system that may or may not um, be able to meet their needs. So I want to acknowledge all these um, valid worries and how much of a burden that is and um, acknowledge that um, actually when Rosa comes back and talks to you and gives her presentation with Dr. Levy about vicarious trauma, that all of this is always going on in the background. And it is so, so important to just acknowledge how much on top of just life and pandemic, pandemic world, how much of a burden all of these and, and the toll it takes on all of us. Um, I'm going to shift gears and just very briefly talk about that, you know, suicide is not the only mental health crisis you, you face or the, um, the only encounter with, um, you know, severe mental illness or other um, problematic mental health um, issues. 
Uh, I'm going to pause here. Shani, do you need to do the second poll? Is this when you need to do it, or is that later? Um, in five more minutes. Oh, five more minutes. Poll. I'm sorry. I thought it was. <laughs> no. OK. Um, so um, if you think back to what Dr. Barry was discussed in our first session, um, you know, psychosis, for example, is something that um, can be a manifestation of mental illness or substance use or other crisis uh, or a medical illness. Mania can present um, unexpectedly um, and can, can derail the work that you're doing with clients or can put them at harm or at high risk. Um, dissociative uh, episodes, we've um, had clients, and I'm sure you have too, who um, are pretty high on the dissociative spectrum, even to the point that they um, may not remember things or may find themselves in risky situations or you may be concerned about their memory or what the, what's happening there. Other forms of self-harm and substance intoxication or withdrawal. Um, this, um, I'm just giving a, another case example. Um, Shani, this isn't your case. This is a different case that I thought about, but I think yours is actually quite relevant if you want to talk about that too. Um, this is a, this is, um, drawn from a couple of different clients that I worked with, patients that I worked with um, from the mental health side, but who intersected with the legal system. One of the pitfalls of doing uh, perinatal mental health is that I also often, uh, even in the private practice aspect of my work, get drawn into custody disputes um, where mental health is at issue. Um, so this was Sherish, the 44-year-old mother of a 10-year-old son separated from her, her husband. Um, the husband had a substance use problem and was emotionally and physically abusive to her. She herself had, had, had uh, experienced um, childhood trauma, uh, had actually been um, uh, in a cult essentially. Um, at one point in her uh, life was put there in a religious cult um, and had to escape from that and has a lot of trauma from that. Um, which is more common <laughs> than you might think. Um, her husband in the context of the divorce and custody proceedings has clearly made multiple false or misleading statements. Um, for example, sending emails in which he claimed to have uh, done something with the son or uh, in, in done some um, parenting activity that he clearly didn't. Um, or, or said, uh, made other misleading statements about things that happened in the past. Um, she also was followed at one point, and in fact, um, this happened from one of my, one of my patients, that the, uh, they, had, they tried to bribe the hairdresser to get um, hair clippings to do drug testing. People would, so there's a lot of stuff there that can go on in the context of these um, custody disputes. I'm sure that none of that would shock you. But she comes to you um, and says that she's like, she comes to your office and says that she's concerned that she was followed here today and expresses concern that her husband has paid you off like everyone else and that you are not representing her best interest. She describes multiple situations in which friends and families and acquaintances have quote turned on her um, and are setting me up to uh, frame her as a criminal. She identifies an error in her paperwork as possible evidence that you are on their side. So um, I don't know how many people have had situations where they've engaged with a client who, um, and this, uh, I think it's one of the hardest things when there is both very clearly uh, abuse and even um, what I would call gaslighting and misleading statements and sociopathy on the side of the um, abusive partner um, and the client, but the client um, themselves may have um, evidence of, of what you think is mental illness, or you are not entirely sure if everything what they're saying is based in reality. And so, I wanted to sort of bring that up as one of these these um, areas in which you have to function in this space of both acknowledging um, the reality of the risks and dangers, as well as dealing with the client who's vulnerable and and um, not necessarily uh, able to navigate things in reality. Okay, I am gonna jump in right before we get to the ethics portion of this um, and put up a poll, everybody. This is the second and final e um, CLE poll for the training. Um, it's up on the screen again. If you don't see it, it's probably just hidden behind a window. 
I'm going to leave the poll up for a minute, um, but even while the poll's up, we can, we can actually go ahead and continue. Thanks, everyone. Right, I'm gonna leave the pull up for just about 15 more seconds. All right, thank you. Okay, so for this final section, I'm hoping we'll have some chance for a discussion around this because I certainly, um, this issue around mental health ethics for, or uh, healthcare ethics and mental health ethics versus legal ethics, um, that those areas of problematic overlap with, uh, that happen, tend to happen the most with the most vulnerable clients. Um, so just wanted to um, outline some of the differences here, which is a very uh, broad brush strokes, um, and then engage all of us in, in a discussion about um, instances where things have been difficult or problematic and how you resolve some of these ethical conflicts. So um, it's funny, when we were uh, putting these talks together, um, Shani, we were so lucky that Shani joined us. And it was interesting, there's so many, not only was the language quite different between the you know, legal system and mental health care system and some of the, and the jargon is so different, different. at times we're talking different languages, um, the sort of ethical framework of you know, even when all parties really want the best interest of the client, of the same person, have and have that at heart, the framework under which we all operate in our professional roles is a different perspective. And so everyone can have the same goal in terms of the well-being and the benefit and what is best for the client. And yet these different frameworks um, mean that we may not be speaking, we may be speaking at cross purposes. So from a mental health perspective, we have a medical model of, uh, around medical ethics, so which is guided by the principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Uh, for, you know, first do no harm. Confidentiality is regulated um, federally by HIPAA, although New York State has different rules for confidentiality um, for mental health, substance use, and HIV. Um, there are, however, exceptions to confidentiality. Um, for example, when there's emergency and uh, there are, are codified emergency and involuntary treatment standards um, that are described as a reasonable cause to believe that mental illness, that there is a mental illness that is likely to result in serious harm to self or others, or if uh, for the involuntary status, or that leads the, the patient not to be able to care for themselves and may put them at risk. Um, and New York State, compared to other states, has actually fairly broad involuntary treatment standards compared to, for example, California or Florida, where it's much, much more limited. Um, there are, you know, as a psychiatrist, I am a mandated reporter, as are most social workers and psychologists, depending on the roles. Um, and so we are mandated to report child abuse, um, as well as violence to non-competent adults um, and then in emergency settings, stabbings and gunshot wounds get reported. There is also the quote unquote duty to warn, the Tarasov um, duty to warn if we know that a, a patient has expressed credible threat to um, another individual, that it, we have a, a duty to warn. So there are many exceptions to confidentiality um, in the context of both uh, you know, protecting individual well-being as well as protecting the community um, safety. Um, and those frame some of the laws around um, outpatient involuntary commitment as well as the inpatient commitment laws. From the legal side, um, and Shadi can speak better for this, but there's sort of defining who is a client and, and that relationship is very specific. I don't know, Shani, if you wanted to go through these. Or, sure. Yeah. Um. So from the legal perspective, it, it is really different, as Dr. Fiddleson is saying. Um, 
we have our own duties and obligations and ethical requirements. Um, but first we need to know who they attach to. And so what's really important is figuring out and defining who is our client because attorney client privilege only attaches to somebody that is our client, um, which under New York law can be somebody that reasonably expects that we are their attorney based on um, the work and the acts that we have done with them, even if we do or don't have a retainer actually officially signed um, for us in the legal service field, especially when we, you know, where we don't charge money, um, you know, it's not like there's this like contract that's always being formed where money is being handed over before work begins. Um, although hopefully we do all have retainers that set out our scope very clearly. Um, so some people on the call, for example, defining who, who is the client is a little bit more clear. I, for example, provide direct service representation to survivors and immigration, family, and matrimonial law. Um, for people that are um, prosecutors in the criminal um, defense context, um, the complaining witness, the survivor perhaps whose criminal case is before the criminal court, isn't their client, it's the complaining witness, right? And so those duties and the, that privilege is not the same as, as people certainly know. Um, once you're able to define if there is an attorney-client relationship, then what we all know um, is that legal privilege, um, the attorney-client privilege does does come into effect. And so if you look at um, what's really important to always be looking and mindful to look back at is the New York rules of professional conduct, as well as case law um, that goes into um, what, what these duties entail. And I'm gonna really narrow the focus here to just be talking about what we're talking about at this specific training. If somebody says they are at risk of causing themselves self-harm. Um, so rule 1.6 of the New York Rules of Professional Conduct provides that attorneys shall not knowingly disclose information that they obtain from a client or information about a client to anybody else without their express authorization. Um, this is a shall not. There is exceptions, but the exception that comes into play here is only a may, which isn't a shall, it makes it discretionary. And this is where there's such a massive difference, I think, between mental health service providers versus legal service providers, we may reveal information about a client to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. This is direct language from the rules of professional conduct. How do you determine if there's reasonably um, certain death or substantial bodily harm where even a disclosure is able to be made if one is cho chosen to the rules themselves give a list of different factors that should be looked at, including the seriousness of potential injury um, if the harm occurs, the likelihood of its occurrence, the imminence, how is it likely to happen quickly? Um, the apparent absence of any other feasible way is actually the language in here um, to prevent um, the potential in injury um, from taking place. Um, and then something that's really important to note is that when this exceptions applies, if, if you do decide to go forward and disclose this because you determine that the, um, this person is at an extraordinarily high risk, um, that there's a clear and defined plan um, that, you, that you believe that it is about to be happening, they are, they are saying I am hanging up with you and this is it. If you decide that you're going to disclose, you're actually only to, permitted to disclose the amount necessary to prevent this. And so that doesn't waive attorney client privilege as a whole, it waives it for this very narrow scope and purpose. Um, and so this is something that's really essential. I think like my absolute best advice would be to speak with your organization. What is your plan if these things come, come up? What should you be doing? Who should you be lo looping in from your organization to make these calls with you? Is there anybody you need to be running things by? What if it's an emergency and you can't reach that person? Um, and, and also providing support if you do decide to move forward in this way. Um, you know, there is um, exceptions and I reference this, so I just wanna go back to it, that if the client explicitly authorizes you to share something that we're allowed to, that isn't breaking privilege, that's with their explicit consent. But authorizations cannot just be general and bland and overarching. And so if I shared a client with Dr. Fiddleson and at the outset of my relationship with the client, perhaps we share an authorization and release because we realize that it'd be really helpful for us to be able to share information back and forth with each other to ensure that 
you know, we both understand what's happening in, in our different spheres and working with the client to call upon each other if there is an urgent need. Um, but if my clients never expressed a risk of self-harm to me outright or suicide, that wasn't waived when that authorization was signed. That wasn't even thought of um, in, in the context of signing that authorization. So we would need a new one. Um, somebody mentioned before, and, and perhaps I'll do a brief example before turning this back over. You know, I've had a client who did call me before where I think the case example that was just on the screen, that doesn't to me rise to the level of permitting disclosure. I don't see very clearly that there's a lack of competence, um, which requires kind of a real want of understanding. It's quite a high bar. There's a lot of case law that gets into that. Um, I don't see in that there is an imminent risk of serious substantial injury to oneself or others. Um, but I have had a client before who, who has called me where it was very clear as I was talking to them that they were no longer grounded in reality. Something that came through on the chat, um, which was so, so important and true, is that while they weren't grounded in reality, they, they were in their reality. What they were talking about was very, very real for them. And so it didn't help for me to kind of challenge to them what they were saying, but instead use the words and the language. I'm sure I could do it better now that I had um, the opportunity to learn more, but, but to use words and language to pull out some more information um, using the questions that Dr. Fiddleson kind of gave us to figure out like, what is the imminence? How likely is this to happen? How grave would the injury be? And what I did in that situation um, is different than I've done before. Other times when I've had a working relationship with a client, I've asked, would you be comfortable calling in somebody right now? They're a mental health expert. They're not a part of this um, scenario, but we, we can call them in and you know I can be here for that call and help connect you if that's easier. Um, what I did with her, because I thought it was so severe that I was nervous about our relationship also being challenged. There's that tension of like, well, I don't want you to not trust me anymore. Um, is I actually called my own support. I called one mental health service provider I have ties with to talk me through what I should be saying and doing um, without disclosing anything confidential or purposeful. And then I worked with the client just talking about like, this must be so challenging. This sounds overwhelming. You know, would you be willing to and want to talk to a mental health care provider about this? Because, you know, not challenging their paranoia that this isn't true, but like this just sounds like an incredible toll to be going through. And then what happens in the context of that relationship um, would be a little bit separate, although obviously there's some overlap with what was happening in my relationship with her. And I also then knew I'm getting an expert in here. They can figure out imminence perhaps in a way that I don't necessarily have all of the tools to figure out myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shani. That's such a great example. And in fact, that sort of handoff of someone who isn't necessarily isn't grounded in reality, um, but isn't at imminent risk of harm. Um, that is where I think, you know, if you can make that bridge and connection with the warm handoffs, that, you know, that person may not be at imminent risk of harm, but the, the they may be at risk at some point of for example, you know, I think the example you were talking about was someone who thought the neighbors were spying on her um, when it was pretty clear that wasn't necessarily going on. There are, that's remarkably common in, uh, in New York City and leads to people being evicted when they become nuisance, nuisances themselves. So that person can lose their housing. They can um, sabotage the legal case, which is an imminent harm, but certainly is not in their best interest. Um, and so that engagement um, with someone who can sort of help hopefully support them and, and get them um, to get on board with, um, you know, navigating both their uh, and being true to what their experience is, as well as uh, helping them cope in more productive ways, um, even if their beliefs are not, don't overlap with what the the rest of the um, system sees. So curious in these last five minutes if, if um, you know, people had other cases or other thoughts about these types of um, gray areas or ethical quandaries that you've experienced. Folks are typing in just one second. Okay.
So yeah, I think there is the, um, the, the potential conflict that seems to be being raised, raised here is, is that um, something that I think you, you actually referenced before, um, which is that uh, what about if, if disclosing, what about if connecting people to resources um, has a direct negative impact on the legal goal that they're actually meeting or could have a direct impact on the legal goal that they're meeting with you um, on. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's an incredibly challenging question. Um, and then there are some mm -hmm. folks, which is just really amazing and, and uh, inspiring, but there are some folks that actually have backgrounds um, in, in both fields. Um, some people are both um, social workers and attorneys, registered nurses and attorneys, and kind of really dealing with like individually what takes precedence, what, what is it that has to, has to happen. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm so impressed with everyone who can navigate that in one per one person. I think it's actually, um, it is, but it is so powerful when you have those perspectives and you have the sort of emotional cognitive flexibility to shift those perspectives. Um, you know, a couple of points, Shadi, that you made that, um, that I think are super important too is, you know, not, um, well, let me, let me, let me answer the, the point that was raised directly. I think a lot of the concerns about connecting someone to mental health care and a lot of our clients' concerns, especially in the field of um, domestic violence and intimate partner violence, is around child protective services. Um, and what happens to people in the system who, when there's custody disputes or when there is some concern that mental illness or substance use may be affecting parenting. Um, and this is, um, um, you know, this is a, um, a, a, a thorny subject and one that comes up not that infrequently, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, our clients, may, our mutual clients, their mental health needs can, can and have been used against them um, in many of the legal contexts too, but deliberately, deliberately and unfortunately um, when misinterpreted. So what I try to convey to my patients and to the, the trainees is that if someone is actively engaged in a meaningful treatment, that our experience is even when we've had to um, be involved with child protective services, that in fact, like judges and even ACS are actually quite relieved when there appears to be someone competent on board and managing the mental health um, issues. And that, that that engagement can actually end up being protective. It is not uh, that engagement with mental, appropriate mental health services, particularly if they're um, in a trauma-informed setting or a trauma-responsive setting where you can really understand all of the underlying issues that can lead to the apparent symptoms, um, can be incredibly powerful in terms of actually um, facilitating our clients getting their needs met and not being dismissed or not being um, mistreated. So once again, we need much more of those mental health resources that really understand trauma and understand the unique needs of our mutual clients. And I know that all of 150 people, 150 of you who are still here um, are, are here because you are so engaged and passionate and advocating for your clients. And so if we can bring those two things together. I think that we will continue to push things in the right direction. Yes, and so just a little plug that the last training in this series, we're gonna have opportunities to really dive deeper into like, so then what would you do if there is a real risk, for example, that somebody's um, accessing mental health treatment or experiencing a mental health crisis could impact their legal cases. What is a good practice model to, to find that we're going to be delving into a lot of those topics deeper at the last training? Um, yeah, we'll have a, we're, we're having a group, uh, a group training where we have some ex uh, experts, some of us are reprised, plus some other experts in, the, in that intersection of the legal system and mental health. So thank you so much, Dr. Fiddleson, for this amazing um, and really informative practical presentation. It really gives us a lot of insight into, you know, how do we navigate really challenging um, experiences when we're working with survivors of trauma. Um, 
Everybody should hopefully see on their screen the post-session evaluation. As a reminder, you can use your camera on your smartphone, hold it up to the screen and fill that out for us. It really, we look at them. It helps us inform what we do and change or keep for ongoing sessions. For those who don't wanna use the little scan, there'll be an email that follows up with a copy of this link, as well as a link back to the Google Drive, which is a reminder, we'll have a copy of this training, all of the previous trainings, and is uploaded with the upcoming trainings um, beforehand. Next week, we're gonna be talking about um, working with marginalized communities. We have a really great presentation um, coming up, so we hope to see um, everybody there. Um, and just a quick plug for those of you who want CLE credit um, for sessions one through four, so not including this session, you'll have more time for this session, but for sessions one through four, you should have already received a link to do the CLE evaluation. I'm putting my email in the chat. If you did not receive them and you attended them, please email me today and fill out those evaluations today because we hope to get, get, get all those CLE certificates out and, and running. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Fiddleson, and thank you oh. again to OVS for giving us this platform. Yes, thank you so much, and thanks for hanging, hanging with me here this, uh, to the bitter end. So I guess we'll end the presentation now, it's after time, so thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you.